Good morning on this Sunday, March 27th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Former President Donald Trump in Georgia supporting his slate of candidates in the May primary. Also a guilty verdict in the Atlanta City Hall corruption trial of Mitzi Bickers. And opponents of Georgia's mental health overhaul show up in force at the state capitol. Melita, Phil, Theron, and Martha are all here. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Well, former President Donald Trump visits Commerce Georgia and a slew of candidates are alongside him. Martha, we'll go to you first this week. At the time of the taping, of course, we don't know exactly what the former president will say, but we probably have a clue. Look, my concern is, and, and of course, he famously kind of stayed out of Virginia at the request of Glenn Youngkin, but issued a very strong statement about getting out to vote. My biggest concern is, is that it's going to be uh, more about looking back and the past than the future. If, if these candidates are going to do well, it has got to be about looking towards the future and, and saying what the Republican values are. Theron, what do you think about, um, do you think he'll be able to give David Perdue a boost that he seems to need according to the polls? Well, Lori, <laughs> I bought some popcorn <laughs> for the show today. <laughs> Put it in a little bowl. <laughs> and uh, my wife is skinny pop. <laughs> Georgia. Let's get our popcorn ready. <laughs> Donald Trump is about to put on the show. <laughs> I think the fact that Donald Trump is coming here, um, he can't help himself. He's going to attack Governor Kemp. He's going to attack Democrats as well. And I think he's going to spend a lot of time telling us what he's been up to all this time. So I think that if you're a GOP person who does not have the endorsement of Donald Trump, you're wondering, okay, how bad is this guy going to talk about me? But other thing, Lori, is that Democrats are going to have an opportunity here to amplify this Trump negativity that I think he's going to bring. And, and while he will motivate the party himself, I think Democrats are going to utilize this opportunity to really attach a lot of these candidates who are there standing with him or who endorse and remind the voters of Georgia some of the negative things about this president. Phil, Democrats are going to sit back and watch this one with popcorn in hand. I think that's great. Enjoy <laughs> your popcorn now. I'll get the popcorn uh, this fall because of the dramatic poll number drop for Democrats, not just nationwide, but in Georgia. And, you know, I don't know of any other politician in America that can pull 30 or 40,000 people to a rally. And as I said before, when we have... Um, I think 26 counties are in Metro Atlanta that would probably go Democrat, you might agree with that. But all the rest in the GOP primary, that is Trump country. And so, uh, just to take Burt Jones, who's running for Lieutenant Governor, uh, Trump endorsed, he says before the endorsement, he would get 20 to 30 people at these uh, GOP clubs. Now they're about 80 people. So there is strength here. And I, I think that uh, the Trump people are part of a coalition. So after May 24th, I think you'll see the, bait, the great uniter for Republicans will be the radicalism of the Democrats. But that did not, wait, before I get to Melita, that did not happen in the Senate runoffs, right? There was no unity, and a lot of Republicans stayed home because they, they didn't believe in the voting system. You're right, but they, we didn't have Joe Biden and the disastrous radicalism and no transparency in schools and rising crime and rising gas prices, so it's all different. Melita. But Trump has attached his brand to some very mediocre candidates down ballot. You've got John Gordon running for attorney general and he couldn't even win a state senate primary runoff. You've got an insurance commissioner candidate nobody had ever heard of before he qualified. And then you've got Vernon Jones who even after he announced his endorsement for Trump, according to Friday's AJC, voted in the Democratic primary, even as he is making appearances on behalf of Trump, who he likes to say he's the second Trump. And so the, the, the Trump brand may help some of those candidates, but I think the Trump brand by being overused in Georgia might diminish the brand because it's attached to some people that were not properly vetted. We'll see what the polls show after the Trump rally. I think it'll be interesting to see, and I can't wait to see what the numbers show. But 
also a new development this week, Martha. David Perdue said that he would debate Governor Kemp, Governor Kemp anywhere, anytime. We didn't necessarily see that in the Ossoff race. Well, I thought that he, he has gotten some pressure because I think about a month ago, Governor Kemp said, I'm accepting these four television debates and we'd like for David Perdue to accept also. Purdue, I think, said, and Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that he was going to do them, but he hasn't as of yet confirmed with those four entities. So, so I think he's got to do that, and he's going to have to debate in this in this um, primary. There's no way around that. He will. He will. Yeah, I think he will. <laughs> well, that debate, I'm going to bring out a new batch of popcorn <laughs> because <laughs> it's no secret that these two men uh, are at each other, right? I mean, Governor Kemp is very upset. He had you know, publicly said this, but the fact that he's actually a Republican governor who most people feel have done a pretty good job in the Republican circles is getting challenged by a credible former U.S. Senator who hasn't raised a lot of money just yet, but assuming to what I'm hearing, I know Phil and Martha know this, that he'll increase that. So I think that first debate, you all, I've said this before, it's going to be about Trump and it's going to be about temperament, but I'll make sure I bring back some popcorn because I think we'll see some fireworks. It, it needs to be a very big bag of popcorn, I believe, <laughs> Well, because I also think that Kemp will excel at getting under the skin of Purdue and will know how to trigger his temper. I'm going to have my popcorn, though, when the congressional race uh, and the Democratic primary begins. With, I'll have some of that with Lucy McBath <laughs> and, and uh, Carolyn Bordeaux. Uh, oh, yeah. That's sure. getting, that's yeah, getting sure. dirty. And, so, uh, and that. that'll be a Republican seat. So okay. give me some popcorn. And we'll be talking about <laughs> that in the upcoming months. But I do want to ask you also, because I want to talk about the Democrats and the governor's race. Well, the Democrat. This week, Stacey Abrams filed a federal lawsuit saying that she should be able to form a new type of fundraising committee that Governor Brian Kemp has already formed at issue is whether she can be the official nominee before the primary even though she doesn't have any opposition Theron. Yeah this is a very interesting lawsuit because what the Abrams campaign is saying is that she's the only Democrat that's running. Um, if you look at how the Republicans um, were able to pass this new campaign finance law it does give the governor the ability to raise money so I think the lawsuit basically says that if the Democratic Party has decided I'm the nominee and I'm the only Democrat running then the Abrams campaign should be awarded some of the same benefits but that that um, sorry that's okay that that Governor Kemp is going to be afforded. Martha. But she's not the Democratic nominee yet. You not still have to she go through a primary, and and you know the, the law matters, words matter, and she is filing a lawsuit saying something's not unfair, but she wants the law to be waived for her. So I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, and she has been able to raise money through all of this. There has been no problem with Stacey Abrams raising money. So it's not a case like when a legislator says wait a minute this isn't fair because we can't raise money during the session and now the governor can through whatever whatever means this is I, I just think that it's it is it is dangerous to look at someone and go we know how this is going to come out I don't think that's helped Stacey Abrams or the Democratic but Party. It, but it gives her another ability another entity with different limits and different limitations to raise more money and that's the that's now the she might have an argument there I, I think that's very interesting but I do agree with Martha I think you know if you're gonna follow the law you wait till she's the nominee well, this week, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan launched ads talking about the GOP 2.0. Phil, his ads basically say it's time to move on from 2020 and look to the future. You know, Jeff Duncan is has been. He's not running again. He couldn't win a Republican primary any anywhere in the state. Uh, this is the same watered-down establishment garbage that, uh, that that the Republican Party has been fighting. That's why Trump won in 2016. He beat people like uh, like Duncan. He beat 16 other. Uh, establishment candidates so I don't think he has any sway or influence really in this state. Melita what does it say about the infighting? Well Duncan was able to raise enough money to run the ads so to, to completely wash him out and and write him off would be a mistake <laughs> and I think he's positioning himself for the future not for only looking at the past. No future for him in Georgia. I, I predict uh, Jeff Duncan, and I've said this on, on you know other segments uh, and podcasts, I predict that I would not be surprised if then former U Lieutenant Jeff Duncan runs for President of the United States in a Republican primary. You know, and I wouldn't go that far, okay, but you remember, you remember when 
David Ralston lost that attorney general's race yeah. many years ago. Everybody said he was washed up. He was never, nothing was ever going to happen. He was a has been, okay? Mm. And he came along and he is now the Speaker of the House and probably one of the most powerful people in Georgia. Look, I like Jeff Duncan. I think that he has the right to have his opinion and he has the right to say his opinion about it. And I am with him in the fact that I think it is time to move on. I think if we do not, we have put Senate Bill 202 in place, which has fixed many of the problems that we had. I believe in Republican values, but also we've got to move forward and not look back. You know, Glenn Youngkin won because he was positive and forward looking. I like Glenn Youngkin and I agree that he was positive and forward looking, but you know, the Trump wing of the party, which is dominant in this state and around the country, uh, also for the first time ever brought in blue collar workers. The Duncans and these establishment people in their country clubs, they don't bring in the coalition that the Republicans need to win. And so you and I believe that this is a center-right party, yeah, that's fine. But we also have to bring in workers. Donald Trump was the first candidate for president in the Republican Party that said, this is now a workers party. I like that. You don't hear that from the Duncans. I, I, I kind of like country clubs, Phil. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know I'm a member of one, you know. All right, we'll move on, everybody. Coming up, a guilty plea in the federal corruption trial of Mitzi Vickers. We'll discuss straight ahead. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. This week, a jury found former Atlanta City Hall official Mitzi Bickers guilty on multiple counts in the Atlanta City Hall corruption case. Bickers helped former Mayor Kasim Reed with election, um, win the election and then worked as his director of human services. Now, Bickers was a kid acquitted of three charges, guilty on nine. Melita, over to you. This is just another chapter, but the book isn't closed just yet because two others who pleaded not guilty are still expected to go on trial later this year. True. I'm wondering, however, if their lawyers might be ready to do a plea deal. And um, of course, her lawyers are appealing. She's out on bond. But I think um, it's going to be interesting to see what the Clayton uh, County voters think about their county commission continuing to have Reverend um, Biggers on payroll at a $130,000 a year salary while she was waiting trial. It, it's going to be a, a good day when this entire sorted chapter of Atlanta history is closed. Well, Phil, it looks like she could be out of her job with the Clayton County Sheriff's Office, too. I think so. By the time we tape, I think uh, the paperwork's going to be done and she'll be out. I don't know why she was hired in the first place. What, a, what, a, what again, uh, uh, the poster child of the culture of corruption that occurred under former Mayor Kasim Reed. It's a disgrace, as you point out, uh, nine felony counts, uh, a conspiracy to commit bribery. The whole contracting uh, problem is still a problem at the airport and that needs to be reformed and this just puts the spotlight on it. All right, well, I'll move on, but I want to stay with the city of Atlanta because former Atlanta police chief Erica Shields not only has a billboard up trying to recruit officers to Louisville, Kentucky, but she sent recruiters down to try and fill job vacancies at her police department in Kentucky. Theron, this was an interesting tactic. I love it. I have to laugh at it because, you know, Chief Shields, for those of us who've talked to her, I mean, she was always sort of a very uh, jovial, uh, interesting police officer that did well in the city. You know, I've been critical on her some things, but ultimately I think she did the best job she could. The thing that I'm proud of, though, Lori, is that while Chief Shields was buying billboards and sending recruiters to Atlanta, our great mayor, Andre Dickens, was recruiting officers. He was doing job fairs, going to malls, going to places, basically encouraging people to sign up for the Atlanta Police Department. Department. And he's also making sure that a lot of the good men and women that put their lives on the line every single day for us feel encouraged, they feel supported. And so this is interesting that Chief Shields is doing this, but ultimately I think the mayor and the chief and the leadership in APD are going to continue doing what they're doing. That is, get new men and women to come join this police force and also make sure you retain the good ones that are there every day. You all are chomping at the bit to talk on this one, but <laughs> Martha, I want to ask you, Shields, she's well respected among the rank and file and she's off honestly able to offer a lot of good pay and benefits and a lot easier place to work you know in Louisville Kentucky um, I like Erica Shields a lot and I think that this is very clever of her to do this I'm gonna take I love what Andre Dickens is doing but don't call him the great mayor yet he's only been there like 90 days we don't want to well I gotta get on message more. early <laughs> you know, and that's right that's right <laughs> um, I think he's doing the right things and he's and he's showing the things and I think he listened to Phil about the 90 days and, and did that but 
But I'm glad Erica Shields is doing what she's doing because she, is, she did value the police officers. And there was a dark time in Atlanta Police Department. I think it's getting better, okay? But there was a period of time where they felt like she was the only one that had their back. And then when she was let go or she resigned, it made it a problem. And Phil, could this signal to the Atlanta City Council, you know, they've given raises to police officers, but, you know, do we need to pay them more? You the took the words, the you took the words out of my mouth. We need a pay raise. Another one. Yeah. But because the, the the starting salary is a disgrace. Right. I agree with that, but and, I mean, also Bottoms gave the, them the biggest. Well, you know that was got. then, and this is now. Okay. I mean, you know what, that didn't do anything. We're still 450 men below. People are still leaving. And, and women. Mor morale is still bad, and um, I still haven't heard. Now, Martha, maybe we're taking baby steps here. I still haven't heard the mayor declare that there should be due process for all police officers involved in shooting cases. If you don't declare that, we're going to continue to have a problem. Alita. Well, I think she fell on her sword for the former mayor mm -hmm. and never doubt the capacity of a smart woman to exact sweet revenge. <laughs> <laughs> from the words of Melita Easter. So. <laughs> All right. Well, coming up, opponents of the proposal to overhaul Georgia's mental health system make their voices heard at the state capitol. That's next. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Mounting opposition to the mental health overhaul at the state capitol, several opponents, many of them conservative, say this is government overreach. Now, I do communications work in this field, so it's very near and dear to my heart, to, to what I do. And maybe we'll start Martha first. We'll just run the table on this one because this is a really important issue. Just your thoughts on, on where these opponents come from. Look, there is some, there are some problems with some of the language in the bill as if you have a big overhaul. There is some language related to abortion in there as well as um, some other language related to other issues. And I, in full disclosure, I'm the uh, interim executive director for the Georgia Life Alliance. And we were not one of the groups that were out there protesting, but we have been working closely with the speaker. And I've spoken to the speaker as well as uh, President Pro Tem Butch Miller about where it is right now. It's passed the House already. Mm -hmm. It's in subcommittee still in the Senate. And they are working on some of these issues. Butch Miller said on my show today, if he had to vote today, he would vote no. But there's a lot of work to be done on the bill and the work is happening. But Theron, this has had bipartisan support. Yes. It's a big issue for Speaker Ralston. Do you think all of this opposition is going to make a difference? Well, I think the one thing that the speaker said, when you look at the AJC article, and he was very positive, publicly and saying, hey, I believe that this bill will pass. And he's put his name on it. And for those of us that spend a lot of time at the Capitol, it's two things, you know, the speaker rarely puts his name on bills to this magnitude. And I've said this before on the show, if you're gonna shoot at the speaker, you better not miss. And so <laughs> the thing that I was very happy when I had a chance to speak to the speaker this week, privately, he was just very emotional about this because he knows that Georgia has for so long punted on resources uh, to deal with our mental health crisis that we have in this state. And so while the opponents are doing what they should do, that's their First Amendment right, I think to basically do this so publicly, and like Martha and her group, just go meet with the speaker. Let's have a conversation about it. But ultimately, when I look at what it does as far as cr increasing access to care, uh, dealing with mental health parities, making sure that our frontline workers have the adequate services that they need, it also deals with our workforce development. These are just good things in this bill, and it should pass. Phil. Yeah, I think those are some of the good things, especially parity. But I, but I think Martha framed it well, and no one's really shooting at the speaker ex unless you're just plain crazy. I, I think a lot of this is good, but I do think, and this is the way legislature is supposed to work, I think there are some questions. Uh, Martha, again, framed it well. I'm not a fan of the World Health Organization. I certainly don't want to be taking guidance from them. I'd strike that uh, uh, language. But, no, I think it's, it's going to pass. I do, too. Melita? Well, I think there's massive misinformation about this bill. And I also think that the opponents of the bill if they were of a different race or class, might well have been arrested for the kinds of behavior they've displayed this week. There were times when there were six to eight state patrolmen outside the committee hearing to control the crowd that was yelling things like heads on pikes. And that's just not appropriate behavior. And, and it's, it's just inappropriate, totally. And, and I do think that the speaker is very confident. I saw him last night at Greg Bluestein's book signing and he was talking about that he believes the bill will pass. The real grit of the matter will be, it'll pass in the Senate, it'll be a different version from the House, who's on the conference committee, 
what that conference committee does to the bill in the waning hours of the session on the last day before Sine die. But right. to Theron's point, he he doesn't put his name, Ross, Speaker Ralston, on many things, and there will be a cost uh, to other bills that are trying to get passed if the bill does not get and through. And we don't point. want that. That's no, we don't want now, that. Let me put my lobbyist hat on. We as people who are down there every day at the Capitol, I, mean, I was begging the Speaker to let us out on the, the Friday before April 4th. I don't think that's going to happen. But if this goes wrong, it, it does have a ripple effect. And it should. Yeah. All right. This week, Governor Kemp signed a bill to give state income tax refunds anywhere from $250 to $500 for those who filed taxes the last two years. Martha, um, your thoughts on this? And, and David Perdue had some comments on this. Yeah, he had some comments um, in an interview he did with uh, a group Fetcher News, which is a, a group up in Northeast Georgia. And he basically said this was electioneering at the at the um, at the final hour and lumped in teacher pay raises, this tax refund and the gas tax repeal together in this. I think it was inartful. It's not something that he should have said because now it sounds like he's opposed to tax rebates and teacher raises. So I think he'll correct that. Phil? Well, I, I think uh, David Perdue will correct that, the GOP gubernatorial candidate. I heard him speak uh, at an event Thursday evening, and uh, obviously he likes teachers, and obviously uh, I think he's talking about the state income tax, which the biggest applause from the crowd when Perdue was speaking was the elimination of the state income tax. I thought that was very interesting. And so he's not looking back. He's doing both. He's looking back. He wants some election reforms and integrity. But um, I think I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, Lori, you said let's look at the polls especially after the Trump rally mm -hmm. where the whole ticket Purdue will be mm -hmm. there um, I think the next four weeks are going to be very interesting in terms of, of a lot of the primary uh, candidates it's be a sprint all yeah. right well Senator John Ossoff was front and center this week at the Senate confirmation hearings of Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson Theron your thoughts look I want to commend Senator Ossoff and also commend Senator Cory Booker uh, who made a very emotional sort of statement about him as a black senator seeing a qualified black woman in Judge Katanji uh, Jackson, you know, there basically facing some very tough questions. But the fact that she's overqualified for this position, she's just as qualified as anybody who's currently on the Supreme Court, and how she just handled herself with grace. But back to Senator Ossoff, I mean, you can just really see him taking advantage of this, They're not attack Republicans, but to commend the judge for her outstanding work in the legal community, but also making sure that he talk about things like law enforcement and certain things we need to continue to talk about in this country. Melita. Well, I also think that these hearings gave um, people a, an opportunity to see the former journalist documentarian in Ossoff in the way he led her to lay out parts of her story that were not being covered in the acrimonious um, kinds of questions that other senators were asking her. So in other words, he didn't do any any probing of her at all. But um, I, I had well, it's to say, much different when Senator Ted Cruz. Well, you know, it, it, listen, some of these, all senators ought to be doing the probing, Democrat and Republican. That's what the whole advise and consent thing is about. But I, I will say this. I've heard a lot of dumb things from liberals over the years. But the one question that was given to this Supreme Court nominee really floored, I think, the nation. And that is, can you define a woman? Well, you know, I didn't go to Harvard like this person, but I think I can define a woman. I know one thing, uh, men can't get pregnant. So what? how come she couldn't define it? You can define it right there, and you well, can define it right, Melita? I just remember you, Phil, on this show just blasting then U.S. Senator Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and other Democrats when they were questioning a Supreme Court nominee. So I would expect for you to blast Ted Cruz the same way that you said some very, you know, poignant thing about how they behave. I want the, the, I want the tough questioning from everybody, but not the incivility and the rudeness that you saw in the Kavanaugh hearings Ted, by the Democrats. Ted you Cruz like that. You probably got was that. the rudest that I've ever seen Very by any U.S. Martha. Senator. Look, these four days, days of hearings were nothing like what Judge Kavanaugh went through. Uh, we have seen in the television age uh, from, from, you know, when Clarence Thomas was confirmed all the way through that people like to be seen on TV. And I'll commend and Senator Ossoff for not rising to the bait on that. Uh, but there's a lot to be said, and she should have been able to answer this question. All right, I gotta leave it there, folks. Coming up, winners and losers, stay tuned. Time now for the week's winners and losers.
Well, I've mentioned this before, but it's officially out. Flipped, Greg Bluestein's book. Um, it's a must read for anybody in the political circles. I even have a blurb on the back. So, Martha, he's my winner. Well, my loser this week is President Biden. I think he showed a real lack of leadership at the NATO meetings. And my winner this week is Madeleine Albright. I met her in a makeup room at the <laughs> CNN studios a few years ago, and we got to be two ladies getting our hair done, talking about things, and it was one of the nicest interchanges I've ever had. What a great memory. All right, Theron. <laughs> All right, my first winner is gonna be my beautiful, intelligent, and phenomenal wife, Dr. China <laughs> Johnson. And uh, my she, doctor, my dermatologist. Absolutely, thank you for that. We need, we need that, we need that bread. Um, but no, happy birthday, uh, baby, I love you. And I also wanna make WXAG, the station in Athens, celebrating 40 years as the first black station. The owner is Michael Thurman, but I grew up in Athens listening to this radio. Martha, you in radio. I got my start in radio before television. But this, this radio station really shaped my life and so many black people's lives in the city of Athens. All right, Phil, about a minute. I know it. My winners are both political parties, believe it or not, on the May 24th primary ballot. Both parties have advisory questions. They're non-binding. It'll be a great frame of reference between the right-leaning questions and answers from the Republicans and the left-leaning questions and answers from the Democrats. All right, Melita. Well, my winner is Senator Dr. Michelle Al for her advocacy this week to gain bipartisan support, including from the governor and Mayor Dickens and representatives from both sides of the aisle, not just what you would call bleeding heart liberals, <laughs> Phil. But they, for a, but they are. A gold dome um, blood drive at the Capitol, which was much needed PR for the American Red Cross and the efforts to address a critical national shortage for blood donations. Nice. And you were at the book signing, Greg's book signing on Thursday night. It was Thursday a great night. event. Is he paying you? <laughs> no, well, let, no. let me just say this publicly. Thank you, Blue, for putting me in the book because I was a little worried. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Make it a great week.